Thank you everyone for joining us for the webinar, Trails Are Common Ground, National Campaign to Reduce Conflict, Promote Respect, and Increase Diversity on Our Trails. My name is Candace Gallagher and I am the Director of Operations and Webinar Coordinator for American Trails. This is our 132nd webinar in the American Trails Advancing Trails webinar series. And a reminder that this uh, free webinar is being recorded. It offers learning credits and includes real-time closed captioning in English. And a link will follow along in the chat box if you don't already see it there. And attendees will also receive a closed caption transcript and a link to the recording in my follow-up email. And we are saving time for attendee questions at the end of the webinar. Um, so we welcome you to send your questions at any time during the presentation via the question box. And before I introduce the presenters and the webinar partners, I want to talk about uh, the 10-year anniversary of our Advancing Trails webinar series, taking place um, the entire month of September, and ways you can win our daily prizes, um, with multiple prizes being given away each day. Uh, thank you to the 40-plus donors. We have more than 80 giveaways, totaling almost $15,000. And attendees of this webinar can have the chance to win one of the prizes shown on this slide. And only those attendees that ask a relevant question during the webinar, or if you take um, our survey immediately following this webinar, you will have the chance to win one of these cool prizes. And I will do a random draw from those that participated just after 12 p.m. Pacific today, and I will be in contact with the winners shortly thereafter. Uh, you can also follow us on our social media platforms for additional ways to win. Um, when we post the daily giveaways at 6 a.m. Pacific every weekday um, uh, morning in September. So let's go ahead and get started with today's webinar. Uh, thank you to the webinar partners that include iZone Imaging, uh, the Bureau of Land Management, the Federal Highway Administration, the National Park Service, as well as the U.S. Forest Service, and also today's webinar presenters. That include Dave Weens, the Executive Director with the International Mountain Bicycling Association, Randy Rasmussen, the Director of Public Lands and Recreation with Backcountry Horsemen of America, Daniel Mc, or, sorry, Danielle McNiven, the Assistant Director with Tread Lightly, Jaime Lauke, the Chief Impact Officer with Washington Trails Association, Nancy Hobbs, Founder and Executive Director with American Trail Running Association, as well as Mike Passo, Executive Director of American Trails. So I will now hand controls off to Dave to get started. Thank you, Candice. Uh, and thank you everybody for participating um, in this webinar. This is my first American Trails webinar, so I'm excited and a little bit nervous all at the same time. Um, I'm gonna just give a little background into how this effort uh, began. And as many of you know, um, the trails uh, already, you know, lots of interest in trails before the pandemic. The pandemic and the, the stay at home orders really drove a lot of people out onto trails and um, trails suddenly became uh, even more crowded. And um, in many instances, we are hearing about increasing conflict on trails uh, among trail users and also decreasing satisfaction with the trail experience. And so we really started to, you know, ask the question, how can we enhance the experience of all users out on the trail and um, help each user group satisfy their needs and at the same time minimize conflict? Uh, let's go to the next slide, please, Mike. So what are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about raising the profile of natural surface single track trails and we are um, focused on, on single track as opposed to um, striped or unstriped um, wider recreation paths. And I guess the distinction that we make is it's a single lane versus uh, a path that would accommodate two directional flow uh, in an easy manner. Um, much of, the, of our conversation certainly would apply to wider recreation paths, but this campaign is focused on natural surface single track trails um, the kind where an unobstructed user generally will walk, run, or ride in the center of the trail. Next slide, please. So we're talking about hikers, we're talking about trail runners, mountain bikers, equestrian, and single track motorized use. Um, and we'll go to the next slide. Uh, these are the organizations that were around the table and helped us craft 
this campaign. Uh, we started meeting in April. We've had 15 or 16 uh, meetings. We've had lots of email conversations, lots of Google Docs. A uh, tremendous amount of effort has gone into um, the, the, the campaign and the work. Uh, just a quick note, not every organization up here who's helping and still at the table has, um, has signed on. They have, um, depending on where their board is or their executive team or other um, situations, they're, they're just not um, necessarily um, on the, the next the slide you'll see later with all of the, the campaigns. But for the most part, all these folks are 100% are, um, behind the program. Next slide, please. Um, we do have agency partners, professional agency. We have a creative uh, organiz um, firm called Cultivator. We've got media expertise, which is backbone and press forward. Uh, their expertise is in influencer marketing. And we do have a budget of $220,000 um, to help this campaign and get it off the ground. And certainly uh, when you bring in um, professional agencies like this, that's where some of that, those resources are going. Uh, really helps us get the word out um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a big way. Next slide, please, Mike. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, it's an important time now. COVID really amplified use on our trails, and um, we started to really try to determine what we could do. And very quickly, when this group got together, uh, the group pointed out the, the lack of di diversity on our trails. And so promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion on trails became a priority of the campaign. Um, next slide, please. So positioning all of the activities as equal partners in the campaign is very important. And as we think about this, there's really um, two primary factors to a great experience out on the trails. And the first one is um, the experience that we have with the trail itself, regardless of whether we're hiking or riding a moto. If we go out and we have a good experience, um, that, that, that's the first part of it. The second one is our interaction with other trail users. And we can have that great day um, running or on our bike or, or riding a horse, but if we have an encounter, a negative interaction with another trail user, even someone from our, our own user group, that really tends to, to, to taint the experience for us. And so in trying to address that, a term that many of you I know are familiar with is, is goal interference. And as we can try to open people's vision up, trail users, to the fact that um, you know, they're not the only ones out on the trail. Um, if it's a shared use trail, it's not solely for mountain biking or any other single use. Um, it's a very, um, very important aspect that we can, that we can get across to folks. Um, so the positive interaction on trails, essentially positive trail etiquette. Um, that's, that's a, a very important aspect of the program. Let me just get my slides going here. Um, let's, yeah, yeah, no, we're, we're good. Um, and I'm just going to summarize here. The DEI is super important. The positive interaction on trails, which is the trail etiquette. And then a third aspect of this is innovating, innovation in trail planning. Um, and this is really important. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. But this is another area that we feel like we can make some progress on. But initially, we're focusing on increasing diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, um, and just the, the positive interactions or the trail etiquette on trails. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. It's really important, and I'm just gonna read this slide because it's this, it's this important. This initiative is fundamentally about respect. It is, impossible to, to dis, dis, it is impossible to discuss our public lands without acknowledging the injustice done to Native American tribes that have long held these places as sacred. It, Thank you. It is essential we acknowledge this truth and treat these lands with the deep respect our nation's first stewards have for them. Um, that, that's very important. And in addition to that, uh, next slide, please, Mike. Um, our, our first goal is we need to work to make trails welcoming, safe, and readily accessible for all people. Uh, next slide. How we propose to do this, and this is really important, you know, we don't have all the answers, uh, but we are committed to listening, learning, and working together to bring about real change on our trails. And we're committed to broadly engaging, inviting, and involving the BIPOC and the LGBTQT communities, um, and we'll listen and we'll learn about their concerns, recommendations, and possible solutions, and we'll make progress. 
Additionally, uh, increasing equity and access to trails for all people is important. And if a, if a community desires to have a um, trail infrastructure and they don't, um, we'll work very hard to, to try to bring trails to places that right now don't have that opportunity. Next slide, please. Then our second goal is to encourage positive interaction among all trail users. And next slide, please, Mike. This, uh, we, we call this our target, and we've all looked at this a lot. Uh, I know there's a lot going on there, but in the middle is our campaign. Trails are our common ground. The next ring that's yellow is, and this is the group really worked hard to come up with this. We, if we first are, are all kind on the trail, an ethos of kindness is really important. And then that ladders down quickly to being aware, just being aware of your surroundings. And the example that we like to use is, you know, when you get behind the wheel of your car, you're not, you know, just staring up at the sky while you're driving and looking around. You're, you're focused, you're aware. And while trail use isn't quite as, as serious as that, it can be in some situations when we're talking about uh, horses and uh, motorcycles and mountain bikes. So that awareness is really important. So that e ethos of kindness, being aware when you step out onto a trail, and then be knowledgeable, have specific knowledge, not only about what you're doing, but what other trail users are doing. And that's where the specific organizations come in. So if you're a runner, you can go to the American Trail Running Association. Um, if, if if you ride motos, tread lightly as your, as your resource for information. And again, not just for information on your user group and what to do um, you know, with your mountain bike or your horse, but how you're gonna interact and what other users that you may see out on the trails. And we were on a call yesterday with an organization that um, basically does kindergarten bicycle programming. They're trying to spread you know, basically a PE um, section on, on you know, balance bikes, those little strider bikes. Uh, and they said that they've, you know, they've talked to some schools that try to introduce bike, um, bike uh, programs in fourth and fifth grade, but a bunch of the kids can't even ride bikes, so that it's really difficult. And it just got me thinking, I know this is kind of pie in the sky, but if there were simple sections beginning in kindergarten in our schools about trails and different kinds of trail users and different kinds of trail use, um, that, would, that would be a, a huge impact on, on the health, the happiness uh, of our population. But anyway, a little bit of a, t a tangent there, but um, I'd love that, 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 that knowledgeable part is very important, how we can increase the knowledge of the folks out on trails so that they understand, you know, principles of yielding, what to do when you see a horse. Um, there, there's just, there's so many aspects of it that, that you all know about. Next slide, please, Mike. Uh, our third goal, and this is where I was talking about the innovation, is that um, where, where we can, trails need to evolve and we need to innovate trails at the system level, meaning how trails, um, how trails are put together. Uh, we need more well-planned trails and trail systems um, that are planned and designed and built to provide high quality experiences for all users. Uh, innovative trail systems maximize the experience of all user groups while also minimizing conflict. And there are examples of, of these kinds of trail systems. And we just um, visited one a, a week or so ago in Salt Lake Valley in Utah. It's uh, Dra the city of Draper. Ha they have a huge trail system there called Corner Canyon. And uh, it's 50 plus miles and, and expanding all the time. It's a huge asset to the community. Uh, it's open to walkers, trail runners, mountain bikers, and equestrian use. And there, there's certainly a lot of shared trails that are, that are bi-directional, you know, folks going in both directions. And that's where the education piece comes in is the more we can get people to understand, okay, this is a trail, there's, there's blind spots, there's people going both ways, there's mountain bikes, there's horses, maybe there's motos in some places. Uh, we have to have some exercise, some caution here. We can't ride our mountain bike the way we want to, the way we, you know, could on a different trail. Then they also have what they call hike and hoof trails, which are for, for uh, walking, running, and horses only. Uh, no bikes allowed. And they also have directional mountain bike trails. So these are places then that that particular user knows they can get to and have that experience that they're looking for um, uh, unimpeded by other users. So. The, the upper Midwest, Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, they've got some innovative trail systems up there. So we think it's important as we can to keep pushing the needle on, on innovating at the, at the system level, how these trails go together. And you know, in, in simplest terms, it's, it's certainly shared use in places but pockets of separate use. Uh, and that could be mountain bike directionals, uh, that could be hiking, uh, running only, that could be equestrian only. Um, and even in some places, OHV parks, it's, you know, where a motorized user can really, you know, do what they want to do on a single track motorized and not, you know, have as many concerns about what might be around every single corner. 
So the innovative part is uh, something that we're already working on at Emba, and I know others are too, but um, again, just to highlight, it'll increase the quality of everybody's experience and it will minimize conflict. When we know it's not gonna work everywhere, um, but Emba does get blank slate tr um, pieces of ground where we, we were asked to plan a trail system for a community. And these are the kind of systems that we're planning right now. We'll ask, what are the uses that you're gonna have? And we're gonna have some, some obviously some shared use system trails, but we're gonna have some pockets of, of directional mountain biking, pockets of hiking only, uh, equestrian, whatever that community is, is looking for in a trail system. So uh, that would be the blank, uh, blank canvas. There's also the, the ability to renovate an existing trail system. And that can be a lot trickier, but we have examples uh, all around the country. The first one that always comes to my mind is Southern California hugely busy trail systems there and a lot of a lot of people go in both directions all the time doing a lot of different things and um, certainly it would be a, a challenge to renovate a system like that in an area that's that, that's, that's that populous but certainly something that we should be thinking about um, trying to do next slide please mike uh as far as on the why of the innovation uh, increase the effective carrying capacity of trails if more people are going to continue to use trails we need a couple of things. We need more trails where we can have them, and we need trails that carry the, the, the load better. Obviously, some places like where I live in Gunnison, Colorado, we don't have as many issues, um, but you know, the Front Range, uh, places around large population centers, trails are exceedingly busy. Uh, reduce the opportunities for conflict, increase the user satisfaction uh, of everybody on the trails. And it results in more users walking, running, or riding away from the trails, having just had a fantastic experience. Uh, which is certainly what we're looking for. Next slide, please, Mike. Uh, just to, 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 to summarize quickly, um, number one, diversity, equity, and inclusion. How can we make sure the trails are safe and welcoming for all people? Uh, the second is, is positive interactions with other users based on kindness, awareness, and knowledge, and then better experiences through innovative planning and design. And the tone of this campaign, as you'll see, is positive, it's warm, it's friendly. We're shying away from the word rules, we're not finger wagging, uh, we're avoiding the sounding preachy. Uh, next slide, please. So this is this is our, our, our mark, our brand, our logo, if you will. And uh, I'm just gonna wax philosophically here. One conversation we've really been having recently, a vision that we have is that, you know, in you know three, five, 10 years, when you see this logo on a, a patch on a backpack, a sticker on a bike, a bumper, a bumper sticker on a car, at a trailhead, it tells you that um, that person, that entity, that trail system embraces um, the principles of DE&I. They um, are all about you know, being kind, the, the, the principles of the program, the kindness, the awareness, um, and, and then it, it potentially could be an innovative trail system too, but I think those first two are the most important. And the first one is really the most important is, um, you know, the BIPOC community hasn't always and doesn't always feel safe and welcome on trails. And if this particular um, logo can begin to mean that to people, um, I think that's gonna be really powerful. And Randy brought to my attention an organization called Black Folks Camp 2. They've got something called the Unity Blaze, and it's just a little, uh, it's a little logo. And the idea behind the Unity Blaze is just that. When you see that Unity Blaze, you know that the person wearing it um, the car that it's a sticker on or the business that's, that's rocking it um, embraces the, the um, principles of, of DE&I. So uh, I know that's a ways down the road, but it's certainly conversations that we're having. We think it could be a really, really powerful element of Trails Are Common Ground. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the role of the program, um, we see Trails as Common Ground as a, a national effort building communal perspective on our mutual use of and respect for trails and one another. Um, very important that we honor the, the trail as well, but it's it's all about the people too. And this is really important. We're not, we're not trying to replace so many of the great etiquette um, campaigns that are out there. They're local, they're regional, they're national. Um, be nice, say hi, ride kind. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of different ones. Ride with gratitude. Those are I'm more, I'm more familiar with the ones on the mountain biking side. But we want to actually amplify uh, those those programs and the great work that, that other organizations are doing. So you'll see that 
Um, it's not uh, it's not functional on the on the website yet, but it will be where we'll highlight different etiquette programs um, from around the country. And they may be specific to equestrians or mountain bikers, or they may be more general. But it's very important that um, you know, we're not trying to trying to bring people together um, and not not shout over people. Next slide, please. Uh, our objectives um, certainly are, are to shift behaviors, um, and that's that's a that's a, a tough thing to do. And are we gonna you know are we gonna get everybody? No. Can we move the needle? We think we can, and we think we can we can make a positive impact. Uh, protect and advance great trail experiences and retain trail users. You know, a lot of new people went out to the trails and um, they went hiking for the first time. They rode a mountain bike. Uh, they they climbed on a horse, and if they didn't have a good experience for for some reason that that we could potentially you know positively impact, then that's a that's a bummer. So we want to keep keep those new users out there because we know how important trails are in uh, people's lives. Uh, amplify that shared trail ethos, uh, draw all trail users to that use specific trail etiquette and knowledge. And uh, our goals uh, as a metric are to reach 1 mil million trail users this year and 5 million trail users in 2022. Next slide, Mike. Uh, this is right from the website. These are the organizations that are uh, partner organizations at this time. There's actually a handful of logos that need to go up. Uh, you've got organizations, you've got brands, uh, you got local trail organizations. Uh, it really runs the, the gamut here. And, and we see this thing increasing exponentially. Uh, there's nobody that we've talked to that says this is a bad idea. Uh, most people are, are way behind it and, and want to get involved and, and want to help. Next slide, please. Uh, these are just some examples um, that our creative agency made for us, and there's no, uh, these aren't uh, on tap to go out. They're just uh, examples of things we could do. These would be magazine ads, and you really get a feel for the positive nature of our messaging. Be trail kind, spread good trail vibes, carry trail kindness forward. Uh, each of these four examples, and you can go to the next slide, um, and you can you can get look at these in detail um, once you have this, these files, and you can see. Uh, the, the positivity, I think, is really important, and that's been something that everybody has uh, has asked us to maintain. Uh, next slide, please. These, for example, are Instagram um, images that someone could put on their their, their social feed. Uh, social influencers are going to be a, a very important part of, of spreading the word and influencing people to, to think about a few of these things. And Instagram is uh, one of those areas where our agency press forward is helping us reach more people. Uh, next slide. Just an example of, of how uh, this can look on Facebook. A lot of folks are on Facebook and it can be a very influential way to, um, to connect with people and hopefully influence some behavior. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just an example of a trailhead sign. Instead of you know, the 18 rules of the trail, just some messages of kindness and some simple messages. Uh, again, no plans to, to put these in the ground anywhere right now, but just um, a concept for for further um, for further study. But we think that as people, you know, walk or ride up to a trail, you might catch their attention with something like this. Uh, whereas the 18 rules uh, and the fine print are a little a little daunting for for users at times. Not that this would replace that, but it just might put a little different um, um, you know thought into their head as they go out onto the trails. Next slide, please. Uh, just an array of, of other options. There's a, a T-shirt. There's some signage in retail stores. Those could be in outdoor shops, bike shops, um, moto um, moto retailers, uh, places where you can buy your your, your tack for your horse. Uh, just constantly reminding people uh, of the of the kindness and um, some of the other aspects of this campaign. Next slide. Uh, just more of the same. Um, you know, hang tags. Bumper stickers, uh, retailers could could actually put it out on their front door, just saying, "Hey, we're we're part of this movement. We believe in this." Next slide, please. And this is these are the campaign touch points. So just left of center down low, you see the website. The website is where we're trying to really drive people to. And then from the website, when you go there, you'll notice that pretty quickly you could find your 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 way to. Um, the Tread Lightly website, for example, or the Imba website, or the Atra website, or uh, any other even regional websites we're putting up there. If someone is in New England, they can go to a mountain biking site in New England. Uh, but we're going to get the word out through social media, through ambassadors, uh, a retail program. Um, there's partner marketing with brands, events. We've had some, some good conversations about events. I think events are a way we could really move the needle 
on the DE and I um, aspect of this, as well as the the etiquette piece. Um, paid media, that's where some of that budget is going. Uh, earned media and, and publicity, and um, and then the own media there. So those, those are just some of the ways we're, we're getting the word out. Next slide, please, Mike. And that's it for me for now. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, David, for that uh, wonderful overview. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Jaime Lauke. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I am the Chief Impact Officer at the Washington Trails Association. Uh, and so as part of my role, I get the fun job of helping WTA work with other partners like folks on this webinar to build and protect trails across Washington State and across our, you know, our nation for hikers and everyone who loves the outdoors. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, excellent. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we do at the Washington Trails Association. Um, we're a statewide hiking nonprofit that seeks to inspire everyone who loves the outdoors to explore, steward, and protect our public lands and trails so that they are trails that last for everyone forever. So you see our vision of Trails for Everyone Forever, which we, we think really fits well with this Trails are a Common Ground effort. Next slide. So we were founded in 1966, uh, and we have grown into one of the largest trail advocacy nonprofits in the country. We work to protect trails through a variety of programs, including a statewide community of volunteer trail maintenance crews uh, that build trails across the state, state and federal advocacy efforts uh, that really amplify the voices of hikers and everyone who loves the outdoors, and up-to-date hiking resources that help newcomers as well as long, lifelong hikers explore all the wonders of Washington. And we are a state-based organization, but we work uh, with coalitions like this to, to try and have a national impact as well. Next slide. So one of the things that we've learned over our 50-year legacy is that collaboration and inclusion are really the keys to building a better future for recreation and our public lands. So here in Washington State, outdoor groups have a long history of working together to improve our trail systems. Uh, WTA has collaborated with local mountain bike groups to build and maintain trails around the state. Um, we've got po popular trails at Grand Ridge Park near Seattle, Upper Labyrinth Trail near the Columbia River Gorge for any folks who are in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and for more than two decades, we've partnered with Backcountry Horsemen of Washington to pack in supplies for our trail crews in the more remote parts of our state. We've seen users from across the outdoor recreation community come together time and again to lobby the Washington state legislator as well as the federal uh, agencies for more funding for public lands and recreation. So we really have seen firsthand the power and possibilities when we all come together to create a better future for recreation across all the different types of recreation we love. Next slide. So this is really one of the things we find so exciting about the Trails Are a Common Ground campaign. You know, having a diverse group of trail users coming together to explore new ways to meet the growing demand for the outdoors while minimizing impacts on the land and supporting our fellow adventurists and helping people build situational awareness and personal commitments to equity. We really can create more positive experiences for more people on trail and ultimately make the outdoors a more welcoming space for all. And you can see some pictures of, you know, all, all the different ways that David was talking about that we'll be talking about today of, of ways you can appreciate the outdoors on trail. Next, oh, no, not, st still on this. Uh, sorry, go back one more. Um, so, so one example uh, is that really just, you know, speaking for the hiking community, hikers can really learn to make choices that make the day better for others. You know, and some examples are, you know, stepping off trail to let someone pass, offering a smile instead of a judgment for somebody who's using the trail in a different way, sharing information about trail conditions or services. And we've seen a lot of that, you know, certainly over the last two seasons where trail heads, parking lots, trail services are really being, you know, uh, hammered by use and, you know, uh, limited maintenance or, or, or different conditions. So these really are just the right things to do, regardless of what user group or community to, you belong to. And that's what this campaign is all about, ensuring that our guidelines and our practices for how to share the trails we love are building bridges to a growing, thriving outdoor community. So now next slide. 
Uh, so, and really one of the keys to this is bringing inclusion and kindness to the forefront of our efforts and focusing on respect and common sense rather than rules and policing. So there are a lot of stories that you see of predominantly white hikers using best practices to gatekeep, shame, devalue, or police newcomers to the outdoors. And one of the things we've seen in Washington State certainly is that the demographics of Washington State and our country as a whole are changing and becoming more diverse. And it's important for our outdoor recreation community to grow and diversify as well. We believe at WTA that people will protect the places they love to recreate. So by creating a more inclusive outdoors where everyone feels safe and welcome, we are creating a more durable, sustainable outdoors as well. And we should also remember that there is no one right way to experience the outdoors. You know, for WTA, a key part of the work that we do is evolving what it means to be a hiker and celebrating the different ways that we can all get outside to enjoy the benefits of nature from backyard adventures to backcountry explorations. And with this set of partners, we can show all of the different ways there are to recreate outdoors on trail and to really enjoy those benefits of time outside. Next slide. Finally, we are committed to helping new hikers understand how to be good stewards to our public lands. And we do this through education and awareness programs like our Trail Smart series, which offers how to's and educational programming in the form of videos, emails, digital boot camps. This year, for example, thousands of hikers learned about what gear should always be in their pack, best practices for how to poop in the woods or use the facilities, as we call them at WTA, and basics of trail etiquette, such as right of way. We strive to ensure these messages have a positive focus and we're reminding hikers to reduce their impact and be good stewards throughout all of the content and hiking information on our website and in our community. Next slide. So we are very excited to explore new ways we can incorporate this positive messaging and these innovative approaches developed by this group of organizations into our programming, certainly in Washington state. And we do believe that by working through Trails Are Our Common Ground, we can share our experiences, learn from each other and our partner organizations to build a kinder, more respectful, and more inclusive outdoors that will ultimately benefit everyone who enjoys and appreciates trails. Next slide. So uh, thank you for your time. Uh, and that was a quick overview of some of the work that we do. If you're curious to learn more about our programs in Washington State, potentially come out on a trail work party or join one of our advocacy initiatives, please feel free to visit our website, check us out on social media, and you'll be hearing more stories about the work that we do with uh, Trails Are a Common Ground in the future. So thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I think we are uh, done with this portion. Good morning or afternoon, everyone. I'm Nancy Hobbs, the executive director and founder of the American Trail Running Association. Next slide, please. We were founded in 1996, so we're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. And with that, we have an, a new branding. Uh, next slide. We're a 501c3 based in Colorado Springs, Colorado, but our reach is nationally and internationally. Um, our mission is simply to represent and promote trail running, mountain running, and ultra trail running. And we do that and fulfill our mission through resources, education, and content. One of the things we have is a searchable calendar of over 8,000 events. And this goes back historically many, many years because trail running events have been happening earlier than when we were founded. We have individual race, club, and brand members. And I welcome you all to check out our website at trailrunner.com. Uh, next slide. And we are so proud to be part of this initiative with Trails Are Common Ground because it really resonates with ATRA, our community, our audience. And with the growth of people using trails, especially since the pandemic, there's more users on the trails, there's new users on the trails, and there's also many people exploring new trails. And one of the things about this initiative is, is that education, kindness, and letting people know what is the right way to interact on the trails. And we're really proud to be part of that initiative. Um, next slide. 
And the ways that we want to help support the mission is to, to introduce the message of Trails or Common Ground to our community far and wide. That idea of practicing kindness on, a, on the trails is something that is really important to us. And we wanna share stories from the trails that reflect and resonate with the messaging through Trails or Common Ground. Next slide. And some of our vision and our, our keywords or our tenants that are really important to us at ATRA is sharing, stewardship, sustainability, and synergy. We all believe in diversity, being inclusive, and welcoming, embracing every body. And that's a really important piece for us. It's not just the, um, you know, the skinny whippet runners that are out on the trails. These are people that could be walking as part of their trail running regime of any shape, size, and ability. Um, the education resources and content are really important to us. Through articles, videos, social media, we share tips on the trails and things that people can do to support their communities. Preserving and protecting our open spaces and trails is also something that's very near and dear to our hearts. And we encourage people to get out and volunteer on the trails and be part of the, the solution and help out with either building or maintaining trails. Partnerships are also really important to us. Those are different organizations and brands as well as events. And one of the events that we are involved with as a partner is the US Trail Running Conference. And that comes up October 27th to the 30th in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And welcome you to check out that website and join and learn more information. With that, um, I will turn it over to the next presenter. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, I'm just getting unmuted here. Uh, so uh, I'm back again, and I'm just gonna talk a little bit specifically about IMBA. We can go ahead and roll to the next slide, please. Uh, IMBA's mission is to protect, create, and enhance great places to ride. And our focus is on more trails close to home. While mountain bikers love to go to Crested Butte and Pisgah and Kingdom Trails up in Vermont and exotic places like that, they spend most of their time riding very close to home on their home trails. And if, if um, these trails are accessed from their house, their, their own driveway, it's even that much better. So uh, IMBA has, you know, in, in its 30 plus years, uh, has really uh, helped evolve trails, uh, all trails, but specifically mountain biking trails or trails that are, that are good for mountain biking. But in so many situations, we're sharing those trails um, with other users. And uh, let's go to the next slide. Just about everything that we do at IMBA uh, fits into something that we call the trails ecosystem. And uh, you can see these, um, these you know, seven or eight bullet points here. Some of them are, are narrower, others of them have a, a, whole, a whole bunch of, of things packed into them. But it's really how, how trails become a reality on the ground is one way to think of this. It's not always um, linear like this or linear, but um, all of these, all of these aspects are super important uh, to the process. Um, but at the very bottom is, is stewardship and that's care and feeding. And that's where some communities are and they're, they're not necessarily building new trails, they're taking care of what they have. Uh, that's a, a very important aspect of the work that IMBA has done for decades. The old IMBA trail care crew, if you remember um, the men and women that drove around the country in Subarus and you know taught local organizations and local mountain bikers and trail advocates how to maintain trails, how to um, you know, lobby for additional trails, um, things like that. So Amber's been very involved in the in the stewardship part, and we we feel like the stewardship piece is what brings everything full circle. Um, but for a new system, vision uh, is very important. And when you have uh, what we call a trail champion in the community, someone who who says, you know, we we need trails, or we need more trails, or we need better trails in in our community for our citizens, um, what is possible? Uh, IMBA likes to, to, to interact with folks like that, um, but then the assessment piece is what is practical, and that's when you look at green spaces that uh, actually exist, and we're doing a pilot project right now where we looked at all of the green space in Omaha, Nebraska, which is a, a, big, a big city, and um, as you could guess, there's lots of green space out in the suburbs and a lot less closer to the city and in the underserved communities like North Omaha. And um, we're working with local organizations there to try to bring that 
um, trail infrastructure to some of the underserved parts of Omaha and um, and see what's possible. There's a lot of, of programming out there, great programming, um, particularly on the mountain biking side. You've got high school mountain bike racing. You've got Little Bella as a program for young girls, all kinds of uh, great programming. But if there's no place to, to do the programming, um, you know, it doesn't really it doesn't really work. I mean, mountain biking takes two things, bikes and then it takes trails. And if you're if you're lacking either of those, uh, you really don't have have the sport. So that assessment is really important. And then access has a whole a whole bunch packed into it as well. And you know, that's permission to use a specific piece of property for trails, of course, whether that's a federal land manager, a municipality, or even private lands. Um, but that access process requires you know, community building and bringing stakeholders together, diverse stakeholders, um, and you know, long, long processes and meetings. Um, you know, behavior of mountain bikers is wrapped up in access because at times we're, um, you know, we've, we've lost access in some places just because of either, you know, poor behavior or, you know, too many users or um, wildlife concerns. So the access piece are so much wrapped into that. So much of our government affairs work um, would fall under that. Then planning. We're, we, we've been doing planning for a long time and planning is such an important aspect of trails. And um, until you have a plan in hand, um, it's really hard to get much um, energy behind the creation of new systems. So we've got a grant program called the Trail Accelerator Grant, which is specifically designed to advance um, communities' plans for trails. Um, and then the design piece, and that's where that's where you know the, the the men and women who work in the trail industry actually go out on the ground and and walk and find the the amazing places to locate trails. I mean, trail design is not a desktop exercise. It's field work. And that's how we get the, the high quality trails that we all enjoy. Uh, and the creation is, is actually building the trails, whether it's a, a club. Um, and IMBA has 200 local organizations, by the way, a club that builds with volunteers. Uh, I've got a club right here in Gunnison that I started many years ago, and, and we build trails with volunteers and maintain trails with volunteers or professionally built trails. And, and um, there's literally tens of millions of dollars of professional trail building going on in the country right now. Uh, it's a thriving industry. It's a growing industry. Um, and it's a really important that the process from, from planning, design to, to construction or creation, um, a, a project can go off the rails at any point along that. And, and we're very careful to, to emphasize that. Uh, and then once you have trails, of course, the stewardship piece. But the two elements that are also really important are the knowledge, uh, also known as the education, um, and the resources, which is funding. So those could come into play at any time uh, for a trail champion to, um, you know, earn access for a system can require meetings in the middle of the day um, that, you know, he or she may not have the, the resources to go to. So a lot of clubs have paid executive directors um, so that they can have people at present at every step of the way um, necessary. So that funding could come into play there where a club needs some funding for that. Of course, the planning process, the design process, and the construction process, lots of funding is needed there too. And uh, our team is working hard to find out, you know, through the Great American Outdoors Act, through the Recreational Trail Program, um, through state sources of funding, corporate foundations, philanthropic giving. There's a lot of, um, of resources out there. And it's our goal to connect more and more funding with great projects all across the country so we can advance the trails. Um, and then the education piece, that there's education that IMBA um, has and, and um, also, you know, we're not the only source of education. We like to, to gather the education from other areas too, because there's so much expertise out there now. And we can be a collator and a disseminator of best practices and case studies as well. And that, that knowledge is, is, is every, every step of this process, it's necessary. Um, so that's just a, a quick snapshot of IMBA. Please check out our website, you can go to the next slide. Um, doesn't have the website there, but imba.com and um, uh, lots of resources there. And I'm going to hand it off to the next person. All right. Thanks, Dave. Hey, my name's Randy Rasmussen. I want to give you the equestrian perspective on trails or common ground and how we got involved is that I've known Dave for several years since um, shortly after he became the executive director of IMBA. We've worked on a number of policy issues together with him and his staff uh, from appropriations in Congress and, and uh, land protection bills that uh, suit the needs for all recreational users and trail users. So I've learned over the years very quickly to, to respect and uh, 
really appreciate the staff and, and what IMBA uh, provides. So when Dave called me uh, earlier this year to talk about this concept, I think Project Trail Respect was one of the initial names of this, of this kind of concept. Uh, uh, myself and my uh, uh, executive committee immediately said, this is a great thing. We think this is wonderful. We want to be a part of this. And we're always looking for opportunities uh, at Backcountry Horsemen of America to, to help get the word out to educate new trail users, people that continue to use trails over the years, and uh, talk about the equine perspective because, uh, you know, the bottom line is safety is, is a really a big concern for us. And we'll get into that in a second. But I'm proud to say that I represent the, uh, you know, 10,000 plus volunteers of, of Backcountry Horsemen uh, that maintain trails. I mean, these are people in over 30 states over 200 chapters across the U.S. And, and Jaime provided a good example in Washington State where uh, our folks work together with hiking and other groups to keep trails open. So uh, thanks, Mike. And, and next slide, too, we can do. Um, just briefly, you know, BCHA's mission uh, essentially is to perpetuate uh, the use and enjoyment of pack stock. You know, I'll use the term saddle and pack stock. So even day use equestrians, pack stock for overnight, or uh, excursions, um, you know, for multi days in America's backcountry and wilderness. So access is important to us. Public lands are important to us. Um, partnerships with all others are critical to us because we're a small user in, in this this big pond of uh, different trail user groups. Our numbers are small, but I just included this picture here as a snapshot. It's an extreme example, but an important one to to say that when we work to maintain trails, and that's one of our volunteers on the left there, Tom Mix. Uh, with a park service employee with a, a 10 foot crosscut saw. When we work to maintain trails for equestrian users, it's gonna benefit everybody who uses those trails, no question. That trail is clearly impassable by anybody uh, until that kind of work is done. And so we work with a number of partners, be it the Pacific Crest Trail Association, Continental Divide Trail Coalition, and a host of other uh, you know, iconic scenic trails and other places and, and lo local trails in the front country too. Uh, to keep trails open for everybody. Next slide, please, Mike. Um, and, you know, how we're trying to help resonate uh, this campaign because we see great value in it for all the reasons that the previous uh, speakers mentioned. I won't go into that. Um, but we created on our landing page a, a direct link to an education page because one of our three pillars, we have both the, you know, the volunteerism stewardship component of BCHA. Uh, we also have an education component. And lastly, we have an advocacy component to our work. And uh, this fits in so well with our education component and our education chair embraced this in a moment and created a web page for our specific content. Um, and, and I'll get in perhaps too about, you know, what some of those equine specific needs are, because I don't think it's it's really well known. So Mike, if you'd go to the next slide, please. Um, folks might be familiar with the yield triangle, and some of you may not be, that's okay. But it's a tried and true thing that in this case, basically, you know, people on foot, uh, people on bikes should yield to horses. It's not because we have any kind of hierarchy, it's simply because uh, the animals that we use, the thousand plus pounds animals are, you know, sometimes close to wild as well as you can train your animal. Uh, there's there's always things that could pop up. So I'll give you an explanation. And this is a picture, too, of just kind of that uh, yeah, etiquette, if you will. In, in this case, the mountain bikers have moved to the side of the trail as far as they can. Um, and there's some brush in the way, but ideally there'd be a little bit more space. And they're talking to the folks on horseback and they're and they're waiting until they pass, until they're fully past them, until they continue their biking excursion. That's a great example. So let me just give you a, a couple of kind of the, the how-tos or whys for us, because we ask trail users to yield to equestrians, people on horseback, um, you know, first of all, because horses are prey animals. They constantly scan their environment for threats and predators. Um, noises and sudden movements uh, and unfamiliar shapes can startle. Uh, a horse and their predisposition to act, you know, quickly when they're startled, fight or flight. You've heard that term. Uh, that's the case of horses. But importantly, the human voice is one of those ways to know that uh, something in the shadows by the tree there with a big backpack isn't a bear uh, coming after them. If you're using your voice and speaking calmly to a rider is really helpful. And um, so we ask folks to move to the downhill side of the trail 
uh, predators, of course, would maybe be a cougar would be up on a rock above or behind trees who want you to come out from behind the trees and, and show yourself and talk to us. Um, and uh, ask the, the horseback rider how you'd like to proceed if you're meeting them on a trail. Oftentimes they'll tell you to keep coming. They'll move to the side of the trail, but the etiquette is to please at least stop and yield and talk to this person on horseback because, uh, and, and wait until they're well past before um, you, you, you know, get back on the trail. So I just wanna mention that. And, and, and Mike, one more uh, slide I think we have here. On our website, these groups here in Central Oregon put together a great two minute video kind of explaining, or at least giving uh, good examples of how to do trail etiquette. We be it hikers and bikers, and in this case, uh, equestrians and bikers too. So take a look at this wonderful uh, video because it's, it's, it's both humorous and, and gets the message through. Um, last slide, Mike, please. Um, our page also has some, did you know, some of the things I mentioned here uh, and some other things for equestrian riders to, to what to do and, and, and how to respond around other users, be they on foot or, or bike. So we're teaching our own folks, you know, the trail etiquette stuff. But again, a lot of times our folks will step aside uh, if, it's, if it's safe to do so and let you pass. But we do appreciate folks who uh, have do keep the lines of communication open, speak to uh, people on horseback, and uh, and always smile. And uh, I guess that's our hopes, or you know, or expe expectations for this campaign is that people have trail experiences where they just come back saying that was just a great trail ride. I met I met people. They were all courteous. We had a great time. There were no problems. That's a key objective of this campaign, and, and that's something that excites us as, as uh, questions. So I think we'll go to our next speaker. Hi everyone, this is Danielle McNiven. I'm the Assistant Director at Tread Lightly. I'm really excited to be a part of this effort today and talk to you all about our involvement with Trails Are Common Ground. You can go to the next slide, please. And actually advance to the next one as well, Mike, thanks. So talk a little bit about Tread Lightly, our history, where we come from. We are a national nonprofit 501c3 organization. Our message was actually created by the U.S. Forest Service in 1985 to speak directly to motorized users about their impacts and how they can minimize those impacts when they're enjoying motorized use on public land. We were spun off into a nonprofit in 1990 to enable the message to be shared widely and to facilitate public-private partnerships, and that's a big part of what we do at Tread Lightly. We work with other local, regional, and national recreation groups as well as land management agencies to provide consistent ethics messaging to the recreating public. Um, additionally, we provide uh, private entities with the opportunity to participate in public land improvement through stewardship projects and communication campaigns, which are funded by their contributions. For over 30 years, Tread Lightly has provided educational programs, uh, volunteer maintenance opportunities and communications that promote responsible recreation in the outdoors, especially as it pertains to motorized use. In the end, our goal is to balance the needs of people who enjoy the outdoors with the need to maintain healthy ecosystems and habitat and wildlife populations. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. So we were introduced to Trails Are Common Ground through Mike Paso at American Trails. And we were really interested in, get, in getting involved. Um, one of our goals is, at Tread Lightly is to simplify the process of getting outdoors for all communities by providing cons consistent messaging across boundaries. Um, very often as recreationists cross from one management system or type to another, the regulations can change. Um, and that can be very confusing to the user. Uh, so what we like to do is, is try to provide consistent messaging that makes sense, an ethic that makes sense no matter where you're recreating, so that there are certain ground rules or, or expectations that can be met by the user and they know what appropriate, acti or appropriate actions are, no matter what type of um, activity they're enjoying. By providing these sound ethical principles across boundaries, Enthusiasts are empowered to enjoy their recreation with the knowledge that they're acting in responsible, sustainable ways. Uh, rather than creating a new message, Trails Are Common Ground uh, provides enthusiasts more access to organizations like Tread Lightly that can provide well-developed messaging um, specific to recreation types. So as I mentioned before, Tread Lightly 
Um, we address different types of, of recreation and ethics for those, but our, our niche and our background is really in the motorized use. And we provide a, an ethic that is based on what we call the tread principles. T is travel responsibly. R is uh, respect the rights of others. E, educate yourself. A, avoid sensitive areas. And D is do your part. We believe that these principles uh, are the our necessary ethos to ensure that trail users are minimizing their impacts uh, during their outdoor experience, regardless of their activity type. So by implementing and using these, these uh, principles, no matter what you're doing, we believe that you'll minimize your impacts and you'll in increase the, the enjoyability of your experience, not just for you, but for others on the trail as well. Um, for us as an organization, the, the end use or activity is, is pretty much irrelevant. It's, it's about the trails and making sure that people know how to treat them with care and respect as well as the other users who are on the trail, making sure people understand um, that they're being good, how to be a good ambassador, ambassador of their sport, how they can make sure to project a positive image and leave other trail users with a positive image of the, of the type of recreation that they're enjoying so that people know that when they go out on the trail, that they're going to be welcomed by a different community, that they're going to have access to information through different trail users, and that they can use that network to learn from each other and really depend on each other to keep these places accessible and open, which is the goal, I think, of all of the organizations here. There are only so, so many trails available for recreationists, and it really is incumbent upon the users and, and organizations like ours to make sure people have the knowledge and, and access to the information that they need so that they can participate, participate in a way that's sustainable. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. So we just wanted to um, really get involved with this effort because we appreciated the, the opportunity to work with different user groups, um, different types of users so that they know that they can come to Tread Lightly for information, that we get we're a collaborative part, that we are a collaborative partner in this process. Um, make sure that people understand that there are there are um, organizations and information available so that you can learn how you can work together with land management agencies, enthusiast groups, and, and uh, other private partners to make sure we can get work done and do it in a collaborative way and make sure that we're all treating the trails and each other with respect. And this provided us with a way to communicate um, more openly with other groups who may not be familiar with the Tread Lightly, uh, the Tread Lightly ethic, but through trails or common ground, they now have, you know, a trail runner has more access to learning how they can interface with a motorized user or, you know, a, a equestrian user can turn to Tread Lightly to say, you know, how can we work together to get some, some of these projects done or what kind of information do I need to know how to interact with these different users on the trail? I'm happy to be a part of this process. Please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions. You can contact me directly at danielle at treadlightly.org or our executive di director, Matt Caldwell, at matt at treadlightly.org. And thank you very much for allowing us to participate today. I was muted, sorry about that. Thanks, Danielle. And thanks everybody else that's been presenting. Um, my name is Mike Passo. I'm the executive director of American Trails. And I wanted to, I'm actually gonna do something that you're never supposed to do as a presenter. I'm completely gonna call an audible. And I had a bunch of really great wonky slides that were gonna talk about how this is right up American Trails Alley. And suffice it to say it is, um, but our goal at American Trails is to unify the trails community. And this, this, uh, this program really is something that is dear, near and dear to American Trails heart. However, I do want to, instead of going through my wonky slides, tell you a story that maybe, because I think everybody that's gone before me has really hit, the, hit a lot of the highlights. So instead, I want to tell you my own story of, of um, trail use and my own um, travel through disability and I use a, a wheelchair and I you know I, I've had maybe two epiphanies in my life and the first of them was about boys and girls and isn't appropriate for this forum but the second one happened when back in way back in 1991 when I was in a mountain biking accident 
I flipped over my handlebars and I didn't kick out of my toe clips. I had been a racer and a very avid mountain biker for years. Um, but very suddenly I flipped over and broke my back and, and instantly couldn't feel anything below my belly button. And that, as you can imagine, caused a whole series of changes in my life. And I was, you know, going through the rehab process and sitting in my my uh, hospital room recovering. And in between my reruns of Hogan's Heroes and The Price is Right, you know, I I kind of stopped one day and I had my, my epiphany that, you know, I was pretty bummed for for, as you can imagine, multiple reasons, but I started to think about why I was bummed. And it wasn't because I couldn't walk anymore. That's not what was forefront in my mind. And it wasn't because, you know, it was more awkward to go to the bathroom. It was because I, for the life of me, couldn't figure out how I was gonna mountain bike again. And that, to me, is the kind of, the, the huge epiphany that I had that people really recreate themselves um, through recreation. In fact, that's the genesis of the word recreation is to recreate themselves. So people hold what they use to recreate very close to the heart. And if you, for any reason whatsoever, if you take that away from a person, it really cuts at their soul. It makes it very difficult for them to move on. And it's also going to create great um, strife and great emotion for them, you know, when somebody, when they have a perceived loss of that recreation opportunity. So I see, I see this, you know, cutting across many things, you know, for people with disabilities, it's, it's maybe a little more obvious or people with mobility disabilities, it's a little more obvious. Um, um, you know, there are many ways that are coming down the pike. Well, there's great technology coming that will allow people of varying abilities to get on the trails, and we need to be open and accommodating of that. Um, and at the same time, you know, if we, for any reason, take away a trail from a person that's historically used it, it could be a disabling condition, like in my case. Uh, it could be... It could be a new um, land designation that, that all of a sudden doesn't allow for motorized use in an area that ha historically has a lot of motorized use. The people, or, or let's say there's, a, there's poor transportation to a trail system that don't allow people of underserved communities or people of color to get to the outdoor recreation opportunity that they really want. Whatever the reason for stopping people from using trails, it's going to cause very strong reactions in that community. And to me, that's why trail conflict is prevalent and why it's a problem and why this program particularly um, is a great resource for trying to address it. And that's our goal moving down the road. Um, you know, if we can ensure that people understand the needs of different types of trail users and make welcoming environments for those trail users, whether it's on the same trail in a multi shared use capacity, or it's whether we're working with our local trail builders and agency staff to build a network of trails like Dave was talking about that serves, you know, where it's needed pockets of individual use and and where it's possible to have multi-use trails. Um, if we can do that, we can make trails a very welcoming place and allow people to recreate themselves. And if for some reason, even if it's unintentionally, we stop people from that process, they're gonna have a very visceral reaction and, they're gonna, and we're gonna have conflict on the trails um, between user groups that don't understand the needs of the other user groups or don't understand the reason why there's, you know, multiple different uses on a trail. Um, you know, I, I know, I feel like I've been watching the questions come across and we're going to get into those right now. But, you know, e-bikes and other very controversial elements of our trail system, I think you know, it comes about from that visceral reaction of the feeling of you're being, 
your opportunity for recreation is being taken away from you. And, you know, the reality is e-bikes serve a great purpose in making trails and biking and those opportunities much more available to a water, wider array of people. Um, and in many cases, that's a good thing. And, and I certainly understand the, the, the very broad um, controversy around how some of uh, e-bike use in particular can can be challenging on some multi-shared use opportunities, but I think we all need to take a step back and, and first try to understand the needs of, of the people that are asking for the use and do our best as a, as a trail community to accommodate those needs. Um, and I, of course, you know, I had all kinds of great slides here about rural and economic development and the burgeoning need for outdoor recreation and the huge number of organizations impacted by the trails community. Um, but I do think ultimately it comes down to developing understanding of our shared trail partners. And that's, I think, where American Trails hopes to gain the most out of this. And we really look forward to phase two of, of this project, which will get into those nitty gritty details of how to build toolkits for, for innovative planning that Dave was talking about. And with that, I think I'm gonna hand it over to Dave for a quick finish. And then Thanks, we'll jump Mike. into Q&A. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. That was that was powerful. And um, I'm just going to talk about the call to action, how you can help. And and really, this house is is um, <laughs> it's not finished, not even close. And uh, it's never going to be. Actually, we're we we feel like trails are common ground. Um, you know, if we've if we've hit on something, uh, it should be around in 10, 20, 50, 100 years because there's always going to be new people using trails. Um, raising the profile of trails. Uh, Mike was just talking about that. If more people use trails in one way or another for recreation and or fitness, our country would be a better place. We all know, I mean, what, what are there, 337 people on this call, take your trails away, you're bummed. Uh, whether you're a hiker or you ride a moto or a horse, I know that I, would, I wouldn't know what to do. It's a, it's a huge you know, pillar in my life to be able to get out there and you know, for some people it's physical fitness, but I think we all understand the the sort of um, the mindset aspect that the trails help us adjust when our um, our significant others tells us you need to go out on the trails because um, you're being kind of a grump. So anyway, lots uh, lots of work to do, but lots of opportunities here and ways that you can get involved. First and foremost, join the Trails Are Common Ground movement by submitting um, your name and your email to us so you can stay informed on what we're doing. And then please feel free to reach out anytime to any of us on the call. Um, you, you'll have contact information for all of us. <clears throat> we, wanna, we want as many people to be involved in this movement as possible. Um, as individuals, you can um, you just spread the Trails Are Common Ground messaging. Uh, we've, we've really gone over that again and again. Um, the kindness, all the positivity, the awareness, uh, the specific knowledge, th those are such key principles. And the more we can just talk those up and encourage people to, to get that and teach as we're out there. One-on-one uh, -on -one teaching, peer-to-peer, -peer, influence is huge. Um, social media, of course, um, land managers and agencies can you know, ad adopt the trail, our common ground principles, help us with the formation, uh, assist with creating more innovative trail systems, certainly the, the agencies and uh, the folks that are in charge of our trails are going to be a very uh, important part of that process. Uh, assist with signage and messaging, um, lots of different ways there. Uh, organizations, you know, your social media, your communications, your events. Uh, if you get interviewed by the local paper or by national publication, mentioning, um, you know, the partnerships among trail users and the importance of all of us, um, you know, finding our place on the trail. Uh, and then uh, brands, um, brands obviously they can help uh, through their um, social platforms, financial support. Um, we certainly can use resources and we're starting to see a, a lot of interest from brands, uh, both in the outdoor industry, the bicycle industry, um, the motorized world. So this is important to everybody that, that you know, we can, that the world of trails functions as well as it possibly can. 
and in a positive manner. Um, brands can leverage their retailers. Uh, they can they can support in advertising. So lots of different ways to to, to get involved. Um, but additionally, support your local trail organizations. I mean, that's really where it starts, whether it's local, regional, or national. Um, you know, supporting those organizations is is huge. And again, we're we're never going to reach the finish line, um, but we're just going to keep uh, keep moving on. And we want you guys to be part of this journey with us. So I think we're uh, heading to the Q and A. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for wrapping that up. Um, we have a, just a huge number of questions, so I'm going to do my best to get through them here or get through a portion of them. And we, we're sorry if we can't get to them all. I know we won't be able to get to them all. There's just too many. But we will um, be following up with all of the questions in a, in a Word document with our presenters later. Uh, to do our best to answer all the questions, even if we don't get to them. So the first of them, um, let's see, from from Robert, I have a question. Is is there a preferred yield etiquette based solely upon one's uphill or downhill path of travel? For example, in general, uphillers have the right of way. Why or why not? Does this differ among user groups? Uh, I don't know, Dave, is this one you want to start with and then maybe Randy or others? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll dive in quickly. And, and this is one that, that certainly we wrestle with uh, all the time. And, you know, the, a rule of thumb that I hear often is um, downhill trail users, regardless of what you're doing, yield to the uphill users. Uh, that's a good rule of thumb. In the mountain biking world, um, uphill riders have the right of way over downhill riders. Um, but and a mountain biker going uphill is supposed to yield to a downhill hiker or trail runner. But in so many instances, it's sort of circum, um, situational. And also the person that, that you're encountering on the trail, they may um, be perfectly happy to, to give up the trail. Um, so yielding is probably the most complex topic that we can talk about when you're looking for hard and fast rules of what to do when, because there's, there's the, the head to head encounters, and then there's undulating trails. I mean, if you've been on a trail where I was just going uphill and I just crested, now I'm going downhill just barely. So, I mean, you've got, and you got flat, yeah, flat trails. So that uphill downhill thing works well in some situations, not in all situations, but um, that's where we get into you know, local and regional differences. Some, some places have um, just different local etiquette uh, for mountain bikers or for other trail users. So we encourage people to really dig in locally um, to that. But, on the Invo website, we're working on the, the yielding right now, but when you start writing it down and trying to put rules to it, it's vast because the situations are so many, uh, overtaking from behind. Um, so, but I think those, those, those common rules of, you know, uphill uh, has the right of way over downhill, uh, mountain bikers yield to the uh, to equestrians and uh, to hikers and trail runners. Those are good common, you know, the yielding triangle that we've had for so long. And uh, the motorized users tend to yield to everybody. Um, and, um, you know, there's, there's, anyway, I'm going to let some other people talk. That's a huge topic right there. Um, but let's continue to try to make progress on it. Yeah, Dave nailed it. I think the important thing is communication. Again, that stop, speak, smile, you know, as long as you're talking to the other party, you'll figure it out. It's common courtesy, common sense. Um, that's the important thing. Yeah, and I'll just add on the trail runner side. Um, it's really difficult when somebody's coming barreling down a you know really fast trail, a single track trail, and there's somebody coming up. Most times it's easier for the you know down the uphill person to to yield. Um, but then again, it's you know it's a real challenge. And I know some of our regional trails um, have uphill only directional signs. So there are some of those that may have an uphill only or a downhill only path um, for that very reason of the, these encounters. And I love the, you know, stop, speak, smile. I think that's really important. And it's a lot of it is, is common sense, certainly. Great question. Great. Any other quick comments before we move on? Nothing, nothing to add here. I think they, the other presenters covered it. I think co common sense, respect, and communication are really good guiding principles for all of us. Great. Excellent. We've 
We've gotten several questions uh, uh, in this general realm from Kim and Laura, but the general question is who is being involved in our effort that represents the BIPOC community and, and reflects diversity um, in the trails community? So we've reached out to, to numerous organizations and as you can imagine, uh, a lot of these organizations um, that work in that area are busy and being contacted by a lot of folks. So we've we've heard back from some people. We you know we we love it. We support it. We just don't have the resources to to help. Uh, we do have Latino Outdoors uh, involved in uh, in our, our working group. Um, we have an organization called Navajo Yes. We have the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians uh, are part of our coalition and. The invitation has been extended to several more organizations, and I think over time, um, as we gain more trust, we will we will see. But that we're, we're constantly uh, in our networks looking for folks that um, could come in and really help teach us, and that we could learn from, and they could be part of this uh, this movement. So the 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 wheels are turning on that constantly. Yeah, and I wanted to just add in, you know, I think a part of this whole process moving forward was with the coalition was a, a really strong kind of pause in the middle to do as much outreach as we could to the BIPOC community, uh, people with disabilities. We also do have several organizations of people with disabilities on on the coalition. And uh, so I think, um, like Dave said, you know, often, especially the the organizations um, that represent people of color are often very very taxed right now. And we we did do an, an talk to a number of people in kind of talking about our messaging and seeing how it resonates among different communities. Um, and uh, I feel like that was pretty thoroughly vetted. Um, well, but it, it, it still needs more, like Dave said, we're continuing in and there's definitely an open invitation to join. In. If I might add, um, you know, I think that each of our organizations are, I know Tread Lightly is, I don't want to speak for the, the other organizations, but, you know, recreation um, groups have really been making an effort to include BIPOC communities in their individual um, communications to their members. We're a member-based organization, um, as many of the other organizations are, and so I think part of the beauty of a collaboration like this is that BIPOC members of our own community can receive this messaging and an invitation to this this effort through our own communications that we that we send out to our members. So I think that's part of it. It's not just you know how it's not just the the trails are common ground group but our groups individually can give this message to our members as well yeah and i'll just add you know we have been very uh conscious of this very uh item and you know i think one of the things we're trying to do is is create that you know first listening um inviting and then action, you know, um, so we're all committed to that. And I think, um, as Danielle mentions, it's really important for us all to strive for those within our own organizations and take that diversity and inclusive message and, um, you know, and amplify it. Um, uh, I think that's really important for, for all of us. Great. All right. Thanks everybody. And we have a, a question from Lorna. How can agencies get involved in the advertising of Trails Are Common Ground and linking to more information on this promo to educate the public and users? Uh, is this one for you, Dave? Sure, yeah. Uh, please reach out directly to me and um, we'll, uh, um, yeah, we'll have a discussion and we'd love to get um, more agencies and, and land man managers involved. And um, again, this is a work in progress. We're going to do as much learning along the way and the e expertise offered by land managers uh, and agencies is going to be crucial to the su success of this campaign. So um, I think my email is readily accessible there. Um, you have to get the I and the E right <laughs> or I won't get it. 
Uh, it's one of those, those German names. Um, but uh, please reach out and um, I'd love to connect. Great, and Emma asks, have you determined any indicators of success for this project? Have you created a baseline measure and are there plans to measure these indicators in the future? I'll start with that. We certainly have this conversation uh, frequently and um, it's not my area of expertise, but we know that it's, it's uh, very important. And um, as we move, as we you know, continue to evolve, uh, we certainly will be measuring uh, in, in metrics and exactly what those are. I can't, I can't tell you, I could make some stuff up, but that would be nice. So um, if anybody else has uh, a little bit more experience you know, from our, our group here that um, wants to comment on that, please feel free. Well, one of the things that we have talked about within our group is to have um, a portal where we can um, try to find our return on investment, as it were, and have listing of the various websites that promoted Trails Are Common Ground and how people have reached out within their own groups. Um, so we're trying to keep that all in a, a portfolio, as it were, on on the online to to measure where we've seen impressions and that type of thing. Um, I think the success is going to be an ongoing uh, thing. And, and once, as Dave mentions, when we talk about having that patch and people seeing it and knowing what it is, I mean, that's our ultimate goal um, in creating this far and wide, I think is really important. Yeah, and in terms of efficacy, you know, are we moving that needle and our behaviors changing on the trail? Are people having better experiences? Is the education that we're facilitating helping do that? Those are tough ones to get your hands around. We, we do need metrics. We do need something and definitely implore folks uh, from the academic and agency side on this to help us explore that of how we can do that uh, and do that effectively because we're, you don't, there's a lot of possibilities right now, but you know, actually getting performance metrics is, is challenging, as you know. Uh, you know, try to monitor human behavior type of things and what kind of sample size, et cetera. But yeah, we definitely need more help in that that realm. And I'll just add, at least from uh, our perspective at WTA, we we really do try and you know measure success by positive trail experiences, but then also. Uh, you know, try and start tracking the the flip side of that and exclusionary incidents or uh, examples of non-inclusive behavior on trail. Uh, and I think as, as other speakers have noted, it's very hard to kind of establish that kind of data and baseline. And one of the things that we do, you know, through our website is trip reports. We can kind of look at those and start to kind of get a sense of how folks are behaving on trail and what we're hearing from our community. Um, but I think we we certainly have more uh, work to do and to figure out how to develop those baselines and would love to hear any other ideas about how we can do that. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. There have been several questions. I see at least three here in the in the general realm of safety and how that's integrated into our program. Um, these are from Kirk and Kim and Ashley. Um, I so I think Kirk's question is pretty good. Sa safety is key for me. His his vehicle was keyed in three places while he was out uh, because he had a bumper sticker that supports aiding migrants. Um, I wonder if programs like Trail Ambassadors could help provide trail ed safety so that everyone does feel safe recreating outdoors. Has anyone tried this kind of a program or for trailhead safety? And the and it also addresses like the safety issues around people of color on trails as well. Um, anybody have thoughts about how safety is integrated into our program or will be? I'll just start and probably quickly pass it off to the others. It's absolutely a foundation element. We, we understand what it means. We understand what it looks like. Actually, you know, creating the change that makes it happen so that something, you know, like that doesn't happen. And we had an example uh, with one of our um, the folks on our in our group. Um, he's an adaptive cyclist, and he got to his car, and, and there was a note in his windshield that said, "You're not welcome here." 
Um, there's there's examples of the, this kind of thing all the time, and certainly that's a, a, a foundation element of what we're trying to avoid. Um, but it's it's really challenging, as you know, to to change. You know, it's not like you can just remind that person that you know they're you know that's not appropriate. They'll go, oh yeah, no, I never thought of that. I won't do it again. It's not as simple as that. Um, so I'd love to hear what some of the other um, panelists have to say about that. I'm, I'm happy to talk just a little bit about you know the work that we do in Washington State. We do have a Trailhead Ambassador Program, um, and we find that that is really great for kind of having a presence on some of our most popular trails and really kind of spreading the messages about kind of inclusive hiker behavior and how we can kind of share the trail. Um, but really, that's very limited. The amount of scale you can get, it, you know, is really limited for the number of trails, certainly that we have in Washington State and across, you know, the nation. But what we find works well is actually training our community about what to do when you see something happening. And so particularly for incidents of exclusionary behavior, we have trainings at the WTA website that we give to, you know, folks in our community, uh, our trail crews on what to do when you see somebody who's not being inclusive and how do you intervene in a skillful way and how do you kind of create a more safe, welcoming environment. Uh, so I think we've found the most impact is when we really get our community behind it and the whole community, uh, and then they can really kind of set the new new tone and new standards, um, but it's it's not easy. Uh, this is Mike with American Trails. I did I did want to point out, I think, just in terms of this this program that we, you know, one of the key elements or one of the key focuses of our program is the RISE uh, concept, which is respect, inclusivity, safety, and oh, help me, Dave. What's the E? <laughs> Anyway, I think my, my point is that safety is one of the four key pillars of, of the program. So I do think that we're looking to build on the safety aspect. And just in terms of your specific question, um, Kirk, there's, I, you know, American Trails knows of probably 15 trailhead ambassador programs um, that that specifically send ambassadors to to trailheads that have trouble like that but but as as Jaime said you know it's it's a needle in a haystack it's hard to cover them all um, yeah I think that's for me any other thoughts on safety before we move on all right Next question um, is from Amy. A number of the partner organizations have actively opposed trails for motorized users during planning efforts, specifically with the Forest Service in California. Does the involvement with trails or common ground mean that partner organizations will now understand the needs for equitable recreational opportunities and work cooperatively instead of combated, combatively? with motorized enthusiasts? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that we're, um, we're gonna, it'll be a case by case basis. And we've, you know, thought about those kind of situations and, um, you know, hopefully we can have better, stronger, more productive conversations. And um, the, there are groups that have different, uh, you know, different, um, I guess viewpoints on you know what's an appropriate use and as as you know hikers and trail runners have the most access and then you know mountain bikes motorized and, and horses seem to have less access this in my mind certainly isn't something where we're trying to give everybody equal access to everything there's um, lots of considerations to, that need to be uh, encountered but what I will say is that it certainly can't hurt and, and hopefully won't make it more polarized and hopefully we can um, be part of, of more productive and more positive conversations that relate to land use planning and, and, and all of that as it relates to the different types of use. Yeah, that e-bike discussion that you mentioned and brought up, Mike, earlier too, is, is one that's, that's front and center. Uh, and we know we have to make a place for e-bikes. 
there is that value that you mentioned to, to many populations that need the, the motor assist. It's more of a question of how that process happens locally, how local stakeholders are involved in deciding what subset of existing trails uh, might be, you know, add e-bikes to or what subset of new trails might make sense. It's the combination of all these things and what opportunities are gained and lost for different trail user groups. So uh, where we've been, where we take exception backcountry horsemen is when there's not that public process uh, and there's a granting of motorized access, in this case, electric motorized bikes on non-motorized trails. Um, there's each of the agencies has a procedure and whether it's Department of Interior or Department of Agriculture and the Forest Service, it still is a public process. Uh, and usually an environmental review process there it brings all the stakeholders together and that's the the local way in which we want to see that happen and we've already given ground to e-bikes on the tahoe national forest and the tahoe basin and other places too and, and we'll probably continue to see some of those things where it makes sense and where the planners have sat down and really looked at that subset and the public to say this makes sense and it's you got minimal you know it's going to minimize the amount of conflicts but conflicts you know will continue to occur there's places that we're going to have to live with that uh, in some places that we're going to have to defend as, as well uh, because of the speed and the safety concerns that equestrians have. All right. Well, I see that we're a little at our time. And thanks, thank you, everybody, for your great questions. And thanks to the panel for your great answers. And I'm going to turn it over to Candace to close us up. Thank you so much, Mike, and, and thank you so much to all the presenters for taking your time to explain. And, and we're excited about the interest that we have from the attendees that were able to attend the live webinar. And I know we have many attendees interested in watching the recording. So um, as Mike mentioned, we do have many more questions that we'll not be able to address due to time constraints. Um, however, I will be working with the presenters to answer any of the unanswered questions in writing. And I uh, plan to send a follow-up email to all attendees um, whenever I have the Q&A ready and we will also add it to the webinar's webpage. Um, and then this, well, not this slide, but the slide that you saw pre previous, it does include all of the um, presenter emails and then additional links that were discussed and all of the web pages for our presenters. That will be emailed along with the link to the recording um, and the closed caption transcript within a few days once I gather all of the materials together. Uh, so again, I want to thank the, the partners of this webinar that include iZone Imaging, the Bureau of Land Management, the Federal Highway Administration, the National Park Service, as well as the U.S. Forest Service. And uh, if you are enjoying these webinars, please consider donating as little as $5 by texting I'm for Trails to 44321. Your donation will go to the Trail Fund, which is a program of American Trails um, that will help enable us to build a fund dedicated to maintaining and enhancing America's trails through maintenance, research, and stewardship training projects. And as I've mentioned in previous webinars, we are really hoping or it's our plan to launch the program to accept applications um, for this funding for any of your projects. So stay tuned and contact us for more information on that. Um, and we will select a couple people who donated immediately following this webinar to receive um, our Trail Boss mug as a thank you. And we invite you to join us for all of our webinars in September um, and to help us celebrate our 10-year anniversary of the Advancing Trails webinar series. Uh, we have three more left this month. And um, if you've noticed, next week's it will take place on a Wednesday um, as we will be honoring uh, a Jewish holiday that takes place on Thursday. So um, if you had already registered for that webinar, please just take note that that's on a on a, um, a Wednesday for next week. And um, so just thank you everyone so much for joining us. Um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and happy trails.